Hello everyone and welcome to your Glass Node on-chain update for week 23, 2022. So today we're going to explore the market from two different angles, mainly focusing on the concept of profitability. We're going to look at this from the lens of the long and the short-term holders, looking at the coin supply they hold and how profitable it currently is. And then we're also going to flip over and look at an interesting perspective on the mining market and some of their incomes that are really starting to come under stress. And some of these metrics we can use to actually track how minor profitability versus their cost of production changes over time. So we really are trading near the lows of the 2021-22 cycle. And what that actually means is that the vast majority of investors from the last 18 months are essentially now underwater on their position. More or less irrespective of where you purchased, these investors are going to be underwater. So what we're also seeing is that miners who've been expanding their operations over the last, say, six months or so, have really started to see their production costs increase, whilst at the same time, their revenues have actually fallen by some 56%. So we're seeing revenues falling at the same time as their cost of production is going up. So what we're going to start with is mapping out some potential bottom formation models to give us a bit of a gauge on where we are in the cycle. We're going to assess this profitability of long and short-term coins, and then we're going to transition and look at this stress in the mining income space and just look at a couple of metrics that really describe this dynamic in more detail. Now, as usual, please do give us a share and a subscribe and a like. It really does help this channel. Um, but I do hope that you enjoy this angle uh, looking at the minor profitability because this is a very interesting topic um, and it may be one that we have to pay attention to in the coming weeks and months. So starting out with our week on chain 23 dashboard, again, you'll find this dashboard in the description below. What we're gonna start with is mapping out where we are in this cycle, looking particularly at floor models. And we are throughout this piece gonna look at the 2028, 2018 through to 2019 bear market, this phase through here as a bit of a guide. You know, things won't happen the exact same way, but it gives us a bit of a context in terms of where we are. Now we have three lines on this chart. We have two that are sourced from the Mayer multiple. Remember that's the ratio of price and the 200 day moving average. And we have two models. One is at 0.8 and 0.6. And you can see that historically, these orange and red lines have typically been around the bottom of bear markets. We've seen them set the floor value. And then as price trades below them, this is where we're seeing less than 15 or 20% of Bitcoin's life has been spent below these levels. So in other words, there's an 80% probability that the market wants to move back towards the 200 day moving average. Now, it's important to note that this is a moving target. So as the 200-day moving average declines, these will also decline. It's also important to note that 20% is still one in five. So it's still a significant probability that we spend time down here. And it can take some time to actually build out any of these bottoms. And also, as you can see here in 2018, we actually traded substantially below the 0.6 level. So it's also never going to be a definitive point. But what we're looking for is confluence. And we can see at the moment we are trading below the orange, which is our 0.8 level. So this means that we're trading at a 20%, more than a 20% discount to the 200 day. And we've just touched down here on the 0.6, which is a 40% discount to the 200 day. And we're currently hovering somewhere in between. Now, the other model we have here is the realized price. Now, this is the average price of every coin that's been moved in the system spread across all of the circulating supply. So in other words, think about it as the average cost basis if we price every coin when it last moved. Now, we can see back here in 2017, we traded below this for a period of roughly about five months before we finally break out in, uh, in, in April and have this miniature run in 2019. Now, at the moment, during the wicking event, during that lunar-induced sell-off, we did get down. We didn't touch the realized price, but we did get close. It was trading down here at about $20, $24,000 at the time. Now, it's currently declined a little bit to $23,700. The realized price will decline when realized losses happen. People who purchase their coins higher prices, they spend them to sell them, and therefore, they are realizing a loss, and there's a capital outflow from the market. So that brings the cost basis down. So this has historically also provided a sound support level. And you can see we're starting to get confluence where a number of these models are actually starting to group up in a similar type zone. We're talking about the $25,000 to $24,000 realm. So again, that doesn't mean that that will be the bottom, but it shows that using past historical cycles, we're in that zone where some of these models tend to converge and we're getting a little bit of confluence in some of these improbable type events. Things that typically, they do happen, but they typically don't happen for a very long period of time. So we can start to think about that in terms of our risk modeling and where the market could potentially go moving forward. 
So now we're going to transition into the profit and loss, understanding the profitability of the network and where we kind of stand. So the first two charts we have is our realized loss. This is the total amount of losses in dollar terms over the last 90 days. So we sum up all of the coins that were moved at a loss, how much did they lose over the last three months, and then we're going to divide it by our realized cap, which really just normalizes for market size. So the way to look at it, we can see that these peaks are comparable now with peaks in previous cycles. Even though we were 10 times smaller in price, we can still compare them because we've divided by the market size. Now, what I want you to highlight is you can see that during the first event in, in 2017 or 2018, where we had the major sell-off, this is when the bear set in and everybody panicked and there was that first major flush out from 20,000 all the way down to 6,000. We had a very similar initial peak in our May, June, July period. We saw this enormous flush out of users who essentially came in and purchased the top. They panic sold and we got a capitulation event through that period. So this is kind of the first event, call it phase A of this bear market kicking in. Now we had a second phase of this, which wasn't quite as extreme during the late stage of the bear. This is when it, almost everyone has been shaken out and we had that final capitulation event and that just completely flushed out any remaining sellers until we were able to form this bottom. Now you can see that we've had a very, very similar trend. We've had kind of actually a double hit. We've actually seen this capitulate in, uh, to a similar extent. You can see it's of a similar magnitude to what we saw back here in 2018. And then also in March, 2020, we've almost seen a sustained period of about five or six months where we've had very, very high realized losses. So again, it kind of speaks to the severity, but this is showing that people are indeed being flushed out as the market trades lower. Now we can also look, that's the realized or the spent, the actual amount of losses that have happened. We can also look at the unrealized profit and loss. This is how much remains in the system. Now we can see that at late stage bear markets, this can trade down to very, very low levels. This is showing that the market is now far below the realized price and the market on average is holding very, very high losses. Now we can also see that, see the bottom of these red lines, we can see that there's a gradual uptrend over time. Now, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to abide by that trend line, but what that's telling us is that as more coins are kind of lost or long hodled, coins that really have much, much lower cost bases and have no reason to move at this point in time or are lost, they are going to continue to push this metric up slightly higher because we're spreading that realized price across all of the coins in the supply. We are gonna get this gradual drift up over time. So now let's zoom into our current price period and compare to 2017. So we can see that we're currently hovering in this orange zone, which is really, we're trading at about a 20% premium to the realized price. We're only about 20% higher than it. If we get down to this level of zero, this is really where we see capitulation events. And you can see they can be quite sharp, where it plunges a lot of the market into a loss in a very, very short period of time. Now we haven't reached that point yet. We're kind of hovering around this twilight zone. Now, again, it doesn't mean that we're going to sell off, but it also doesn't mean that the bottom is in. We're kind of in this middle ground where we're, we're, we're almost at the point where people's profitability is bad enough that in previous cycles, we have seen that final capitulation. And really what it comes down to is, do we have a hodler base that's actually more strong in this current market? Or is it gonna behave much like previous cycles where we actually still need to have that final capitulation event? Or do we also need to account for this gradual uptrend and perhaps doesn't need to get as bad and maybe this lunar self was in fact the capitulation. We're trying to assess all of these risks and that's where we combine it with the confluence of our models above. It's a non-straightforward process, particularly with the macro environment in the background, but we're just trying to get a bit of a gauge on where we are in this cycle and how it compares to the past. So we're also going to look at the profit and loss held by the long and the short term holders. I'm actually going to zoom in on these two particular charts. So this one up here we've, we've looked at before. We're looking at long term holders in blue, short term in red. The darker colors are the coins that are held in profit as a percent of supply and the lighter colors are coins held in a loss. Now I'm actually going to break those apart into the profit on the left hand side and the loss on the right hand side. So we're looking at those individual components here. Now, what I wanna highlight initially, let's look at our profitable coins. So you can see that the short-term holders during the bull particularly are in a lot of profit. They're pretty much holding, you know, they're buying the dip, it's rallying higher, they're selling, they're buying the next dip. We're seeing short-term holders churning over these profits. Over time, long-term holders in profit are selling their coins. So we see a decline in their overall supply. We can see this here in 2020 and 2021 as well, same impact. This is that transition of wealth from long to short-term holders. 
Now notice that in 2017, as the bear set in, we get these spikes where short-term holders are back into profit, then they're down again, back into profit, down again. But note how these spikes get less and less and less until we finally capitulate and there's just simply no short-term holders left. Every single short-term holder is inside the bear market. And when we capitulate in this instance by another 50%, there's just nobody left. So we get this massive decline in profitability overall, long-term holder supply and profits at a relative low, and short-term holders are almost entirely removed from the market. Now, here we are in our current cycle. Here's the bullish phase. We had our initial shakeout in May, June, July, which took all short-term holders into a loss. And here we are having these kind of spikes again, where we get short-term holders return to profit, return to profit, but less and less and less. And we finally had our lunar capitulation, yet another capitulation event. And we can see that short-term holders are barely in profit. Only those who stepped in and bought the absolute dip during this current market are currently in profit. So really, long-term holders dominate profitable supply. And that's what this chart down the bottom is showing. This high level here is over 90%. That's showing that long-term holders own pretty much all all of the coins that are in profit. That's what this is trying to describe. So now let's think about it from the um, coins that are at a loss. Given we're trading at the bottom end of our current consolidation range, this whole 2021 to 2022 cycle is kind of one big sideways consolidation range. You can see a very similar pattern to 2017 in our loss making coins or the coins held at a loss. So note that long-term holders, initially, it takes a little bit of time as the bear market sets in and they start their accumulation. And you can see that their coins, even though they're in a loss, they continue to grow their supply. They start shouldering more and more of these coins in a loss. Long-term, uh, sorry, short-term holders in red continue to kind of carry more of these losses. They're transitioning from in profit to in losses. So you can see there's kind of a healthy balance of short-term holders in a loss right up until we finally get the relief rally where it puts everybody back into profit. Now you can see a very similar effect here. We've got long-term holders, this trend line that's pushing long-term holders upwards. This is showing that over time, those coins are cycling, even though they're held at a loss, they are returning to long-term holder status. People who are more experienced, they're more willing to hold onto these coins for a long period of time. This is this shuffling of ownership. And this is an important concept to get your mind around. Coins can go from a weak hand to a short-term holder, from a short-term holder to someone else, and they can move around a lot and get traded through the bear. But at some point in time, the long-term holder, the hodler, the people who really don't mind what Bitcoin's price is doing, they're fairly price insensitive. Eventually that coin will find a hodler who will take it away. And this process takes time. This is why bear markets aren't over within a short period of time. It takes time for those coins to eventually find a good home. And then we start to get that changing of ownership. And we can actually see this in the data through both of these bear markets. We've got a healthy supply of short-term holders and speculators and traders, but we also have this pool of long-term holders that continue to grow their holdings, even though they're held at an unrealized loss. So it's a bit of a takeaway. We are seeing that changing ownership happening. Long-term holders do own a lot more of the supply, but as always, we still have this very, very large pool of short-term holders holding unrealized losses, and that potentially creates that sell-side action. So this is the headwind that essentially the market needs to work through. Doesn't mean it has to capitulate, but it generally means it's going to be some headwinds as the market tries to work out where the bottom is and eventually has to push through that overhead supply on the way back up. So now transitioning into the mining section. Now, this is an interesting topic. Miners really, I mean, they provide the security for the network. And historically, what we've seen is that they will invest in more capital. They will buy more uh, hardware, more, more facilities, logistics. They'll make all of these expenses and these costs will be incurred typically around the bull market. When cash flows are strong, the market is bullish, they are able to fund their operations and they will use that capital to deploy and buy more equipment. Now, the challenge is that once that equipment starts to turn on, we will start to see difficulty rising. Now, as difficulty rises, the cost of production is harder to mine every individual Bitcoin. Bitcoin protocol will continue to change the difficulty so that we can't mine faster than the, pre and then the 10 minute block time. So it will continue to make the puzzle harder and harder and harder even though miners are now spending more money on their new hardware, their new power, they've got new operations and they've got new capital overheads. So miners invest at the end of a cycle typically, and then they have to weather the bear market with increased costs, but falling revenues. This is the model that we're going to explore here. This is the concept of what we're seeing play out. Now, 
We can start here with our minor net position change and our balance in minor wallets. And what I want you to see is that really since March 2020, you could even argue since um, 2019, we've seen predominantly miners have been adding to their balance. We've seen this generally green. We've seen growth. During the bull market, they did distribute quite a chunk. They sold a little bit down here at the lows. Remember, this is when a lot of miners were getting shipped out of China. So there was a lot of just undue or unexpected costs that were incurred. But generally speaking, for the last two or three years, we've seen fairly strong accumulation. They've been adding to their balances. Note here we are following the lunar sell-off, and we actually have net distribution of somewhere between five and 6,000 BTC per month. And we can see that minor balances are in decline. They're essentially having to sell their accumulated reserves to cover costs because their incomes are no longer providing the same that they were before. They have to sell more coins in order to recuperate the same US dollar value or fiat value, depending on where they are. Now, the Pule multiple is one of these oscillators that was designed to really map onto this behavior. If a miner, they're generally very long-term time horizon. So what we look at is their one yearly average income. What's the average income over the last 12 months? And then we compare the current income to that level. Now you'll see that the pure multiple corrects significantly during halving events. So following the halving event, you'll get a significant decline because their revenue literally drops 50% overnight because you have this uh, reduction in the block reward. But then price, uh, generally following that supply squeeze that happened in 2020, we see that price pushes their incomes to a higher and higher level. So we can see that this generally oscillates in line with Bitcoin cycles. We have lows that get printed when incomes are very low, miners are stressed, and we get the final capitulation of not only investors, but the mining cohort as well. Rigs start to turn off. When someone turns off their rig, difficulty comes down. All the miners who remain on the network can then mine a little bit cheaper, and the stronger miners end up making more money if they can weather the storm. And then the cycle tends to repeat, much like many, many commodity cycles have similar boom and busts. So we can see that the pure multiple is currently hovering just above these very low levels. We saw it in March 2020, and we saw it back here at the late stage of the 2018 bear market. So we are currently hovering above that extreme minor income stress level. We're not quite there yet, but this is the metric of the week that I would be paying attention to in case we get that further decline in revenues. Does it plunge miners even further into income stress? And to really close out and just describe this mechanic in even more detail. So remember, here in, in May 2021, we had a lot of the miners, about 52% of the network, get moved out of China. They were essentially banned from operating, and we saw an almost overnight decline of 52% of the hash rate. So here in pink, our difficulty, the puzzle that the miners have to solve, dropped precipitously. It was actually the largest drop in history. Now, since that point, since around July, Note how we started to recover that hash rate. So other miners stepped in. We saw hardware being shipped out of China. A lot of it went into North America. A lot of it went into Kazakhstan. We saw a reshuffling of the mining industry. Truly an incredible feat, to be perfectly honest. Now, note that we came back up to our all-time high, somewhere around here in December. But note that we've now pushed on to even higher, higher highs. We are now at an all-time high in terms of difficulty. So that means that there is more hash power on the network solving the Bitcoin mining puzzle than was there before that crash, which means that there's been an investment. So there's been capital expense. Even the miners who shipped that hardware from China elsewhere have had to incur logistical costs. So this money has been spent. It's been financed. It may be on debt. It may have been cash. Nevertheless, that money has been spent. So we've seen since the all-time high in November a 132% increase in the difficulty, and that means that Bitcoin is now much more expensive to mine. Now, at the same time, since the all-time high, minor revenues in blue have fallen by about 56%. So they are now spending more money to mine each Bitcoin by the cost of production, but their overall revenue has declined by 56%. So you can see this divergence, which is creating that income stress that we can observe here in the pure multiple and manifesting itself in miners having to sell their reserves, their balances, in order to cover these excess costs. So I hope that that's a useful insight into how the mining market works. Um, for anyone who's interested in the pure multiple, we actually have a video series on this and a very detailed entry in Glassnode Academy. You'll find links to both of them in the description below, but I do hope that you find that useful if you want to explore this metric and this concept that little bit further. Other than that, I will see you in the next one. Thanks for tuning in. Cheers.